Hey guys, Luke LaFontaine. Today, I'm gonna to explain to you how we get from this Chris to this Chris. Stay tuned. Hi guys, Luke LaFontaine here, Cold Steel. I wanna to talk to you today about the Javanese Chris and the history, a little short history on the Chris because we now make two Chris blades in our lineup. Very, very popular knives, the Lynn Thompson Tylite and our Voyager Chris. Super popular. This one is almost out of stock, soon to be, and people are gonna have to wait to get more of these in stock because they've just gone through the roof. But they're beautiful pieces and the influence for them is obvious. You know, we've got some examples right here. This is a Javanese Chris reproduction from Lynn's personal private collection. Uh, beautiful blade, Javanese Chris, encompassing three parts. The Chris is made up of the blade, the hilt, and the scabbard. You can see that a lot of these got really, really ornate and are incredibly beautiful. The wavy shaped blade. These can be traced as far back, they believe, as the Dong Song culture in ancient Vietnam during the Bronze Period, 300 BC. And I wouldn't be surprised. There are a lot of examples of blades like this in stone carving reliefs uh, all throughout the 9th century. The 8th and 9th century, you see a lot of stone carvings with kings and warriors wielding or holding Chris blades. So the Javanese Chris, pretty much the oldest example. I also have a Moro Chris, which is another beautiful example. The Moro Chris, which is Filipino, and you can see the design changes a little bit here. Really, really intricate handle with beautiful bone, ivory carving, wrapped grip, the guard and the blade. Now, if we look at this blade, a Moro Chris has got a different shaped blade. There's waves in it and then it goes straight. The other thing is if you look, it's got a downward pointing tip, which facilitates the thrust. Uh, beautiful piece, but look at it. It's not very big. This is actually a Moro, this is a Chris sword. And it's not very big and there's a reason why. There's a saying in the Philippines, the jungle will take your sword. A friend of mine told me that. It was a very, very famous martial artist. and. It's true. If you look at when Ferdinand Magellan went into the Philippines in the 16th century and he brought the Spanish with him, there are numbers of accounts of the Spanish troops trouncing through the jungles in the Philippines and losing all kinds of their gear, daggers, swords, all sorts of things. Why? It's really, really thick, dense jungle. So look at the size of this blade. Look how flat it is. If I wear this flat against my body, it's gonna stay with me. If I have any kind of intricate guard that comes off, the jungle will take my sword. The jungle will take your weapon. You'll walk by, hook it on a branch, it'll snatch right out of your belt, and three miles into the jungle, you'll go, oh crap, where's my sword? Too late. So this had an absolute purposeful design in its shape and in the overall size. If you're in the jungles and you are a Filipino warrior, you don't need anything bigger than this. This is a perfect size for hand-to-hand -hand combat or bladed combat that is in close quarters. You don't need something bigger than this. And so they figured that out really quickly. So the Spanish had all kinds of problems in the jungle having longer side swords and rapiers and shields and pikes and other weapons that were absolutely not suited for the Philippine jungle. Um, henceforth, the jungle will take your sword. But these are both beautiful examples of the ancient Chris. And they were influences for Lin 
to create his own crisp blades. And to my knowledge, this is the first modern crisp blade in a long time. I know that, you know, back in the 40s and the 50s and 60s, there were German and Italian made stilettos that had what are called like flambeers blades or flame blades. But not since then has a company decided to recreate the crisp blade in this fashion in, you know, a beautiful overall package with a gorgeous crisp blade that's made out of high quality steel. This is a signature series. This is the Lynn Thompson Tie Light. And like I said, it's gotten super, super popular. And so I think we're almost out of these. We'll get more in, but I don't know when. And our Voyager series, which is already a famous series of knives, and we decided to go, Lynn decided to design this crisp blade to go in the Voyager series. Now, another thing that's really interesting about the crisp blade is that this blade design does make its way all over the world. So it goes from ancient Vietnam all the way through Europe. Because you've all heard of flambeers blades or flame blades on things like long swords, great swords. I went to the Santa Barbara antique weapons show a couple of years ago and saw one of the most beautiful examples of a flambeers bladed small sword that I'd ever seen. The waves were incredibly tight. The blade was about 32 inches long and it was just a spectacle. It was an amazing piece and I couldn't even bring myself to ask the dealer the price of it. Um, but the crisp blade is something in terms of its design that made it all around the world. And when you look at European flambeers blades, there's a number of different types. There's a number of different designs, but it started right here and made its way all the way to here. So to this day, 2020, this blade is still living on in new designs. And I really like it. I think it's a great idea. Um, the design factor in terms of coming up with a new folding knife, it's not easy to design new folding knives. If you look at all the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of knife companies that have now popped up, it's not easy to come up with a new knife design or a new folding knife design. And I think that Lynn Thompson has hit the ball out of the park with this knife and this knife. I think they're great new additions. Like I said, they're super popular, um, great quality steel. I love the design of the blade. And historically, this blade has got a purpose. It's primarily a thrusting blade, but all of the waves in this blade serve a purpose offensively and defensively. Offensively, when you cut, every time you hit one of these ridges, it cuts deeper and deeper and deeper as it goes forward or back. Defensively, if another blade is to make contact with your blade and slide down your blade, this wave pattern disrupts your energy. So that if you were trying to slide down someone's blade and attack their hand, the wave in the blade actually disrupted what it was that you were trying to do. So it gave you extra time on all of these blades. It is an absolutely purposeful blade. And even though there were just as many of these that were very important ceremonially as they were as combat blades, this is an entirely purposeful blade. It's not an arbitrary design. There was a purpose to this and it worked. So we wanted to replicate that in a folding knife because it's been a while since anybody decided to do it. And besides, you know, like I said, the old German stilettos, I haven't seen it done since. And like I said, I think this really hits the mark. These are fantastic quality knives. You know, it's a new design. It's something new for you to have in your collection, but act fast because these things are selling out and we'll get more in but I don't know when, so you want to get your hands on one now. Um, hope you guys have enjoyed this. Little, little take on going throughout history from how we went from this to ending up with this. Um, keep watching. Keep giving us that love. 
And if you're new, subscribe to our channel. We've got over 800 videos for you to check out and keep you busy. Until then, thanks a lot. This is Luke LaFontaine. See you soon.